The world of Remnant is a dangerous place. Particularly for man. Hello and welcome back to the Game Master's Domain. This video signifies the start of a new set of videos and shorts we'll be doing, where instead of just going over a character, subclass, or set of monsters, we're instead going to be taking a look at a video game or anime setting and seeing how that can be adapted into a D&D campaign. Sometimes we'll instead build a certain moment from the series and talk about how we would approach that particular encounter in D&D. Of course, we're just making a baseline here, going over things we think could help or different ways to approach the situation. And there are many different ways to make things work here, we're always happy to hear from the viewers on how they might do something differently, or if there's anything that we forgot to add in. So as always, feel free to leave any criticisms or suggestions in the comments below, and with that, let's get started on our first video. An IP that was the leader of one of our recent content polls, and if you've already read the title, you know that, that is Ruby. If you haven't heard of Ruby, it is an American-style anime focusing on CGI animation set in the world of Remnant, a world infested with monsters called Grimm, and a society trying to thrive around them. Of course, the plot and world get significantly more complicated than that, but where the show sometimes lacks an explanation, it leaves the door open for people like us to expand on the ideas they introduced and make something fun and unique for those who may not enjoy or know of the show. While I personally think there are a few too many separate plot lines in the show, they actually make sure that if you're only strictly sticking to the stuff from the source material, there's plenty to explore. So, starting off, if you have decided to make a Ruby-based campaign, you need to decide if you want to include the characters and plot from the show, or if you're just going to be running with the setting and using your own plot. Using the story's plot and characters could potentially give you a lot more to work with, but might make you feel a bit awkward if you feel like you have to perfectly portray the character. But keep in mind, this is all for fun, and if you don't want to include them, don't, and if you do, have at it. Some ideas for the main two parties being Team Juniper and Team Ruby, you could have Pyrrha and Jean be paladins, I feel like Yang and Nora would work well as barbarians, Rogue for Ren and Blake, and Weiss and Ruby are the only ones that don't really match up, Weiss fitting more into the Blade Song Wizard, and Ruby I feel mostly fits into the style of a Battlemaster fighter. After you've decided what kind of NPCs and story you want to go into your world, it's time to build the ideal party. In the show, the party is four people, which seems to work really well for D&D, but I don't think there would be any issues with a party of five or six. Now, if you are a fan of Ruby, you are no doubt familiar with the phrase, it's also a gun. Which seems to fit for most of the weapons, as they have a melee form, and usually a ranged form of some sort, whether that be a sniper, a grenade launcher, or a set of pistols. This is just something to keep in mind when you're setting up your campaign, as the firearms aren't particularly powerful, but they are a large part of the show, at least in the visual aspect. But if you want to keep them in there without making them too overpowered, I would recommend using either a modified bow or crossbow with a bonus action to switch from melee to range, or there are many homebrew firearm rolls that you can find for D&D with just a quick search. Other than that, building a party in this setting should be fairly similar to how it is in any normal D&D game. Moving on to the races in Remnant, everyone seems to be either a human or a faunus, which is just a humanoid person with animal characteristics, which could encompass a large number of races from D&D as a whole. There are also some androids and artificial humans that can be played in place of Warforged, but it's really up to you if you want to limit races at all, or just let all the normal D&D races fit in and edit the setting around them. Either way you go though, they're both viable options, and I don't really think it would hurt the campaign either way if you include them or don't. However, what I would suggest including are the special abilities known as semblances. A semblance is something that all hunters and huntresses have, which is a power fueled by their aura that is unique to each individual person. For instance, Ruby gets a speed boost or somewhat of a teleportation ability as she turns into a storm of petals and flies through the area. I would recommend giving this the flyby ability so she doesn't provoke attacks for opportunity. Yen gets stronger as she gets angrier and takes more damage, low rage. And Pyrrha can control metal and weapons through magnetism. I think it'd be fun to discuss with your players maybe a personal small ability or feat that they could carry into session 1. That would be an extra perk or something unique they could add to the party and help them fill their role even better. After your players have built their characters, you should consider a plot. I mean, having a base plot ahead of time is usually a good idea so your players don't have to wait too long between character creation and actually playing, but it's always a good idea to also include your characters' backstories in the plot, just so they have something to hook onto. Within the show, Ruby and Yang have their own mother issues, Blake has her history with the White Fang, and Weiss has, well, her attachment to one of the biggest companies on the planet. All of these aspects are a pretty large role of the plot of Ruby, 
and doing the same thing for your players will definitely help them feel like they're part of a living, breathing world. So just make sure to pay attention to their backstories, and don't leave any one player stranded for too long without any story hooks. As for the plot itself, again, that's really up to you if you want to follow the main plot in defeating Salem and finding out what's happening with the Grimm. Or again, just ignore that entirely and do your own thing. Between the different countries, the stuff with the White Fang and the Faunus, Atlas Core and its advanced technology, or the gods, their powerful artifacts, and the maidens as well, there are tons of different angles and paths that your story could take, and it's up to you which one you want to follow. I personally think that having a campaign with a large leg of it focused on finding and protecting the maidens would be fairly fun, as well as the idea of building each of these in homebrew in some way, shape, or form. You can also easily come up with your own explanations for things, such as the Grim, and maybe working towards taming them or defeating them outside of using Salem. And just the same for the gods and the maidens, if you aren't a fan of how the show portrayed them exactly. All in all, if you're a fan of the show or looking for new ideas, Ruby offers a lot of interesting plot hooks and ideas, and can be easier for newer DMs or ones who prefer to make their campaigns based off an idea rather than coming up with their own whole new world. You don't even really need to acknowledge any of this as being from Ruby, because DMing is mostly improv and grabbing things from other media that you've seen and adapting it into your setting. So, if you think people might have sort of a negative reaction to you building a campaign off of an anime, and an American want that, just, uh, don't tell them, and I guarantee people either won't notice, or if they do, they won't really say much because without the namesake, the campaign's still pretty fun and feels just at home in D&D. That does it for the general overview, and now we're going to go into a little bit more detail on some aspects of the world, but I'll still be doing my best to avoid any spoilers. On the planet of Remnant, there are four separate nations, or kingdoms. These are Vale, where the first few seasons take place. It's considered a fairly safe place to live due to its many natural barriers and strong defenses. Its capital is the city of Vale, which is going to be a theme for these kingdoms, by the way, home to one of the four huntsman's academies known as Beacon. To the west of Vale is Vacuo, who have a bit of a rougher time when it comes to landscape, with most of their land being desert. The people here tend to live a more nomadic lifestyle outside of the few oasis towns, and their own academy of Shade, who seems to have a bit of a tighter grasp on Vacuo's people than even their governing council does. Going further east, back past Vale, we have Mistral, a large mountainous kingdom with its capital of Mistral, and two other smaller settlements in Argus and Kuchinashi. And just like the others, it has its own huntsman school in Haven Academy. And lastly, we have the northern kingdom of Atlas, the most militaristic and technologically advanced of the bunch. This kingdom consists of its capital city, Atlas, Mantle being the next largest, and a few smaller ones further down the road in the frozen wastes. Unlike the other kingdoms, however, Atlas is governed by its military rather than a council. It is also considered to be one of the more, eh, there's no really light way to put this, racist kingdoms when it comes to the Faunus, although Mistral used to be right up there with them. Like I said, I don't want to go too much into detail to avoid spoilers, so that will do it for the rundown of the kingdoms. Next we have the various groups that are at play throughout the show. Obviously we have the Huntsmen and the Schools, but those mostly fit into one larger group, so they only count as one. The only one I would have separated from them would be Atlas, with their more militaristic ways. With automated soldiers and mech suits, they don't quite fit in with the run-of-the-mill hunter or huntress. Moving on from there, we have the White Fang, what used to be a peaceful civil rights group for the Faunus turned terrorist. They cause some trouble early on in the show, but they end up just being the beginning of a much larger issue. There are a few more factions, but they don't really present themselves until later in the show, so that will cover the factions for now. Moving on from there, we have the monsters known as Grimm, the enemies that you'll be fighting most of the time during your game. These monsters are born of hatred, anger, and other negative emotions. More than that, they're drawn to those emotions, congregating in areas with high numbers of people feeling negative emotions, which does often lead to a snowball horde of Grimm rolling through a small town after a tragedy, only leading to further emotional outbursts drawing in more and more, until only a husk of an empty town remains. This is where I think the optional stat of sanity could help drive some of these events. Now obviously you don't want to be making individual sanity checks for every NPC in a town, but having a town-wide stat may be influenced by the presentation of the town, so a more prosperous town would have a bonus to their sanity checks, while a run-down town would have a negative bonus. Now obviously the party would have their own individual sanity stats, but when inside of a town they would get to add or subtract the bonus from the town's sanity stat. This would also encourage players to indulge in more downtime activities that would help relax their characters, 
and make sure they aren't attracting any additional trouble for the party or any towns they happen to visit. These beasts also come in all shapes and sizes, from basic wolf-like monsters to scrying tentacle orbs, and even to dragons, so your game won't be lacking when it comes to monster variety at the very least. That does it for the monsters for now, and let's move on to our last category, Aura. When it comes to the world's magic, or lack thereof for the most part, all hunters and huntresses have aura, and through that they're able to use their semblance, which aren't magic, but for the purposes of a D&D game it functions the same way. The same can go for dust, although I might call those more ammo or spell components, or perhaps a unique item allowing you to change the elemental type of a spell or add additional elemental damage to your weapon attacks. Anyways, in the show, aura is a shield in some ways, and a battery for your semblance in others and as long as you still have aura remaining, you are able to use your semblance. Like I said before, for a semblance, I would recommend a small ability or feat to start off with that can grow with the player. Here is where I would also bring back the bloodied mechanic, a rule where you don't actually start to take hits and damage until you reach half of your hit points, and until then you are simply dodging or blocking, wearing down your stamina. In this case, I would count the first half of your HP as aura, and as long as you are over 50% of your total HP, you can use your semblance but after that you either need to take a rest or be healed over that 50% threshold in order to use it any further. Just for some examples, one of the first role-playing games I ever played was based on Ruby. The powers used there range from a petrifying touch, to soul cords that could bind things together, to inertial reflection, used almost entirely to dive bomb on enemies from planes and take no fall damage. They were weird, and maybe a little bit overpowered, but very fun overall. But that will do it for now. I hope you guys like this new kind of video. I do plan on doing some more in the future as well to help break up the homebrews, and to give me more time to work on them as well. In the case of the Patreon rewards for these videos, I think I'll be adding smaller packs with some of the NPCs, monsters, and stuff like that to help kickstart any game you may be running in this setting. That will about do it for today though. If you like my content, remember to subscribe and like the video, and if you want to help feed the insatiable appetite of the YouTube algorithm, leave a comment down below. I'll see you all next week, and have a wonderful day.